Today on A Couple of Pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Nate Nasrallah from Fluence. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Ricky. Um, I've been looking forward to it. I'm incredibly excited about this conversation because it is one of my favorite topics, enterprise sales. Super complicated, a lot of money, whether you get it right or wrong. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that's typically the draw for a lot of people. They're like, oh, enterprise sales is lucrative. And then they realize, wow, enterprise sales is really long and hard and pretty frustrating. <laughs> Yeah. And what's most interesting to me, I see a lot of the top of funnel work too. And I've found like companies that are hiring for BDRs uh, or SDRs, the director of business development is looking for your classic extroverts. That's what they think does better as an SDR BDR. But they've also got this internal promotion strategy. And I'm like, mm, you know, when you're getting to the enterprise sales, I thought if I had to look at the top 10 sellers I know, probably seven of them might be more leaning towards introversion. And they have these just, I think there's just a general lack of understanding when it comes to enterprise sales, how enterprises buy, and especially post COVID, how you have to sell to them. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you are going to be far more likely to find an enterprise seller reading a book on a Friday night than going out to some type of like bar club scene, just because that tends to be their more deep thinking, a little bit more strategic, you know, not to say that, you know, you won't find both, right? Maybe um, oh, there's a little bit of a stereotype there, but I do that only to kind of maybe pop the bubble around you know, the common stereotyping and thinking. Because I agree. I agree. It is much more impact focused when you get up into enterprise. Two big things I want to discuss today. One, your new book, Selling With, how to enable champions, how to sell with champions. And the other thing I want to talk about is just in general, Fluent Group and what you're doing to help enterprise sellers. Let's kick off with this book. What spurred it on? Yeah, well, it was mostly like a collection of everything that I had learned just by building teams, bringing products to market, selling to large enterprises myself that um, number one, I never kind of went through, I never had like a formal VP of sales. I was always selling the first product and building a team underneath me. So I never went through any formal sales training and I just kind of learned a lot by figuring it out from first principles. And my point of view started to form around this idea that it's not sales reps who are closing the deal. It's our buyers and more specifically our champions because they're actually in the room when a decision is being made. And so in light of that, in seeing ourselves as like we're enabling champions to go sell internally during an internal buying conversation, like what needs to be true about our practices and the way that we operate. And so selling with is kind of a collection over the last decade of um, kind of learning, figuring that out and seeing so often a lot of the sales content talk training that sellers go through is so focused on the sales rep and the sales meeting. And then it just kind of missed yeah. the point of where the sale is actually going down, where a deal is won or lost. So that's where I'm kind of selling with came from. Hopefully it will help a lot of people make some of the mistakes that I was kind of, I was learning the hard way over time. Well, I think when you start looking at selling being the act of facilitating buying, you start to get to these deeper kind of processes. Like how can I facilitate this person to make a sound buying decision? Well, let's start off by understanding how do they actually make decisions? That's right. I think it is a great reframe. So talking about this concept of a champion, I've always been a big fan of challenger methodologies. I'm a big fan of you know, medic or med pick as we would use at pointer. This concept of a champion, just in case somebody doesn't know, could you just define it? Sure. So I'll define a champion as somebody with three different kind of traits or characteristics. They have influence, meaning they can change the conversation internally. They have incentive. So they actually want the deal to go through. Like there's something that's in it for them that's going to tie them to the deal. And then third is information, that hard to find type of deal intelligence where they can shepherd the deal through the internal process. And you need all three of those things. Like if you have influence and information information, but there's no incentive there. You're an influencer. You can change the way the deal goes down, but you're not you know, truly a champion. And then the other element that I would put on this is champions are based on buying behaviors and evidence of moving the deal forward. So it's kind of like the difference between potential and kinetic energy, where you could have the potential to be a champion, influence, incentive, information, and so on. But if you're not actively working behind the scenes to keep the deal moving forward and you can't see the evidence of that, you haven't converted that potential you know, into somebody who I would call a true champion. That's brilliant. I've always resounded with the simplicity of one of Andy White's statements where he says, a seller with a stronger champion wins. And it makes me think of like two kids with battle blades or some kind of card game where it's just stacking up. Who's got the stronger card here? That's right. And by the way, two sellers, you know, let's say on opposing sides, a competitive deal, they each have built up a champion 
champion, not all champions are created equal. You can kind of rate the strength of a champion based on their internal reputation, track record, standing with other folks on the buying team. So just because you have a champion doesn't mean you have the right champion or the right series of champions for the dynamics of that particular deal in that particular company. So let's talk about enabling this champion because enterprises as a process are trying to eliminate undue influence, bias, corruption. And so they trying to remove the authority and power of any given individual. So how do you get this champion to navigate this scenario where they essentially swimming upstream internally? Yeah. Part of what you're doing is you are helping that one champion sell a group so that the entire committee, and by the way, this is what creates a truly complex deal. It's not the size of the contract or anything else. It's the number of contacts. It's the number of people involved. Yeah. And that's what the, especially the large enterprise is trying to do to make a safe, low regret you know, highly confident decision is they go around the table and they make sure everybody is all on board. And it's also why sometimes like one skeptic can hold as much sway and power over the entire group. And so basically the art is consensus. It's helping the champion to get everybody on board so that everybody's moving forward in the right direction, which I mean, that is a hard job. It's a really hard job. And that's why kind of the job of the seller then is to enable that champion to go sell internally. I appreciate that so much. In Australia, in general, if you were to define the business culture and compare some of the differences to America, Australians are very risk averse. And that filters through to how we do business. Nobody wants their name on the bottom line. Everybody wants decision by committee. How can I remove risk from this decision? Is that a big part of how you enabling a champion or how you're trying to facilitate it. Do you put risks under one of the important metrics or is it just a massive topic in and of itself? Well, both. I mean, it's not always an explicit metric either. It's also a feeling and it's emotion in inside of the buying team and inside of that champion in particular. They're trying to figure out like, am I safe in raising this deal, pushing it forward with my team? And so part of how I think of it in the job of enabling the champion is to create a bit of a social safety net inside of that company. So, you know, we'll tie our worlds together here. When you think about your prospect, strategy and how you're setting up first conversations in the account, the wider you're getting early on to do this with a number of contacts side by side in parallel, they can look at each other and be like, okay, I don't feel like I'm going at this alone. I'm putting 100% of my own reputational capital behind the deal. You're creating against the safety net. So I think you have to be very intentional about how you start the deal, the phrasing, the language that you use with that champion. And I mm. think the analogy that I'll give to you, so in a lot of my research that I was doing with buyers specifically who have championed products as we were designing our platform, I remember I was talking with this director of IT who was talking about some of the DevOps tools that he had green. Light. And the point that he called out was he's like, I'm really not concerned with the dollars in the budget that we're going to be spending for this. I'm more concerned about my own chips that I'm going to be spending. Chips meaning like his social capital that he's worked hard to accumulate for himself. And the point yeah. that he made was this. He's like, regardless of whether or not we sign a contract and actually buy the product, I'm spending those chips at every single step in the process. So just to move the deal forward, even if it goes nowhere, it's cost me something to do that with my team. So I have to be yeah. very sure that this is the right move. Great way to think about it. We forget about the internal politics when selling. We're always thinking about our product. Our, our CRM is better than the CRM they're using. The person mm -hmm. you're selling to was the person who decided to implement the CRM that they're using a year ago. He would lose all kind of credit internally to say, ah, actually, I stuffed up and now I'm championing the next thing. Yeah, some might, some won't. But that internal politics is probably more relevant than the product you're trying to sell. Yeah, most definitely. And that's where the art of creating a effective message for the champion to bring forward is key because if you approach it as, hey, this past the sh decision, it was you know not a fit, wrong fit, bad product, rip it out, replace it with this. This is way better. What's going to happen is you're going to hit a brick wall because that product owner is going to dig their heels in. But if you reframe it as, hey, needs within the business have shifted. We're operating in a different environment than we were four or five years ago. You did an incredible job paving the way for the next generation of products that we're going to build on to make this shift totally different conversation, right? And so that's part yeah. of the, you know, the job of the enabler is what you've just done there is at the language matters so much because essentially trying to do the same thing. But what you just did was you created an environment where the person would have felt psychologically safe to say, okay. And that's a real, I mean, this is more about psychology than selling. Right? This is about when, you, when you're talking to your kids and you know, if you phrase the question one way, you're just going to get an answer. Like, how was your day? Good. You know, that is the answer. I guarantee that's the answer. 
response. And I bet you if you ask your kid, how's your day? They're just going to say, good. You have to frame it in such a way that elicits a response in the way you want it. So I love what you've just done there. Is creating psychological safety. Like, how do you measure that? Like, how do you, as a sales leader, say, well, I need to facilitate this through my deals. How do I know if my reps are doing this or not? Well, one, you won't know unless you are actually listening to the conversations. Like, if you are totally hands off, the last time that you were on a call or listening to a call, like, you can't name the call. Well, that's yeah. one thing. Like, you have to get into the details because the precise language is very important. And this is what like a simple like call summary will miss is the nuance in the conversation. And mm. so you're looking for things like, like here's a very practical strategy is if the seller is creating a hyperlink back to a past decision that was already executed in the buying team so that they're showing some congruence with the way that they're thinking. Like an example mm -hmm. of this in my world, you know, we focus on helping champion sell internally with a written business case. And so if yeah. I'm in a conversation with somebody who previously purchased, like maybe they led on the rollout of Gong or Chorus or a conversation intelligence, yeah. you know, we might might start talking about the fact of, you know, it seems like your sellers having quality conversations is really important to you. That's a piece of how you're driving revenue, you know, so prior decision, something that they, you know, agreed to. And then I would build a case around, do you believe the same thing for how your champions are talking about you internally? How are you thinking about the quality of their conversations, right? Good thing. Yeah. Conversation quality matters, drives revenue. I agree that was a good purchase. And here's this other element that we can build on by hyperlinking back to something in the past. It sounds artful and really clever and replicable. Not if you could say, hey, on this deal, are we able to tie this current purchase back to another purchase they made where they were trying to achieve the same objectives or within the same category? So we can say like, we can already see this is important to you. So they coming off that, they agreeing with themselves now. They don't want to disagree with themselves. Themselves. There's so much deep psychology behind it. It is brilliant. But this is the difference between enterprise sellers and small to medium business because in SMB, they can make an emotional decision. One person, the founder, the CEO, the head of sales, you're like, I like this. You're like, why do you like it? You're like, just bloody like it. And that could be enough. That can't happen in enterprise. Oh, no. You'd get it, fired. People would be like, look, this person can't be trusted to make good decisions. Yeah. Or they just get shut down entirely. Because if you think of like the weight of an enterprise company to try to shift their direction into something new, I mean, you literally need an executive working for months and months in order to shift and pivot the direction of a company of that size. So it's far better to align with something that is already an existing priority. And then you show some continuity with past behavior, you know, totally different story than trying to shift and change behavior. So that's like one clever trick. And if I took anything from this, if, or if that was the only thing I took from this call, that's enough. And right? how can you tie your current sale to a prior decision? That's brilliant. How many of these little tips and tricks are there through an enterprise sales process where you're going from outbound or initial engagement or inbound through to discovery all the way through. How many processes, how many steps are there in an average enterprise sale? Is that something you could answer? So it depends on the deal, but what the way that I would think about it is less steps between what the seller is doing with the buyer, because for every one interaction that we have with somebody on the buying team, it's going to kick off this ripple effect of so many other internal conversations. So the way that I would think about that question is, what is the series or the volume, rather the volume of internal communications that is happening across the buying team. And if you have a buying committee of 20 people versus 100 people, which by the way, I have been part of those like triple digit type deals and it is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. That's how I would think about it. And that's why it's hard to give you one number, but actually I'll have to send you this chart. There is one visual that I put within I'm selling with that is calculating the communication overhead inside of a deal based yeah. on the number of buyers and steps. So you can actually go figure this out and it ranges when you kind of go through that anywhere from 400 to 4,000 interactions or points of communication inside the right. buying team. So this is the big thing. It's the part of the sale that you're not there for. That's essentially what selling with is, right? Like you've got a partner that you're selling through. They're this champion. What are some of the engagements that they are having that are mission critical? Like this is when the deal is getting done and you only find out about the outcomes of it 
off to it. So one of the most, I guess, influential key, like it can totally change the direction of the deal is when the executive who owns a priority is looking at the deal for the very first time. And within a matter of a couple minutes, if not seconds, they are either going to mentally write something off as a distraction and irrelevant or something mm -hmm. that aligns with what they are already sold on and they care about and they're telling their team to invest in. And I give you an example of this. One of the people that we worked with and kind of interviewed as part of the book, she is the EVP of global payments at MasterCard. So any type of transaction in the global payments network, it, it's her, right? She owns the yeah. decision. And when I was talking about this, like how does somebody raise a new project or a new idea with you internally? And she's like, to be honest, you have to fight so hard to grab my attention, so much so that I had somebody walk into the women's washroom with me trying to... I, this is my own team, right? Like he was physically yeah. there following me into the women's washroom to get a word in to say, this is something that you need to look at. And so the way that I would think about it at first is your deal will either come alive or it will die based on short sound bites that either grab the executive's attention and they say, I care about this, or it fades into oblivion and irrelevance. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of sellers don't realize you can send, I mean, stacks of decks and links and case studies and have these hour long yeah. demos. And it's all going to come down to at first, like, you know, without exaggeration, a 20 to 30 second sound bite, And then you have oh, to build from there. I love that because I could tell you just from empirical evidence, the amount, like if I was to measure the size of the company or the seniority of the executive relative to the amount of words they use per email or are willing to read or reply to, the higher up you go, the shorter the message every time. Like just that executive yes. summary, one line answers. When I'm selling to an executive and they're the one that engaged with me, I say, I'll get your proposal. They will say, I do not want a proposal. Could you get it to me in four bullet points? Like they specifically right. don't want it. They don't want to have to read through 20 page documents. Whereas when I'm selling to small to medium business, they want all of the information at this stage. Whereas this executive knows he's going to make a decision back on the four bullet points. He'll then push it off to his team. We can go through the due diligence. Yes. And there are two pieces to that from... This idea of buyer enablement, selling with champions, those four bullet points, one, it is far more challenging to craft four solid bullet points than it is to send four pages of information. And so a lot yeah. of people who haven't tried this before, they're like, oh, that sounds simple. I, you know, you're telling yeah. me I only need to send four bullet points. It's like, well, no, that's actually very hard. Who's, I never know who said this, that, uh, that famous quote of, if I had more time, this letter would be shorter. Blaise Pascal. It's a great Blaise quote. Pascal. That's it. And it genuinely is true to like bring it down to fewer words. My wife's a copywriter. I get a glimpse of it sometimes. And it is an absolute skill. You mentioned something there that really triggered me, buyer enablement. Are we fucking introducing another category now? Talk to me about sales enablement and where sales enablement sits within this enterprise sales process, specifically with regards to what we're talking about now, about enable this, enabling this internal selling versus coaching a team, which it typically is. Yeah. So sales enablement is looking at how do we ramp, train, and enable the seller to be very good at the activities that the seller is involved in. Meetings, demos, follow-up, so on. Now, yeah. buyer enablement is saying, okay, AE or AM, you are now an enablement team of one. It is on you to enable your champion with the content, the training, how to message, who to sell to. And so you've just become this mini enablement department. How are you going to go get your champions ready to go sell internally? And so it's the shift further toward the internal activities happening on the buying side versus sales enablement is looking at what are we doing for our sales reps? How do you relate this to deal qualification? Is there a particular framework that you like to use that you think best encapsulates what you're doing? Is it unique and customized for every company? So there's it, you will ultimately adapt it because the question is like, what is, you know, there's a bell curve. Every buying team is going to have some nuance of how they evaluate and buy and so on. Some people may not even know, right? And so they kind of figure it out as they go. But if you kind of cluster for most teams who have successfully bought your product, what were the steps and activities that they did internally? Then what you should do is map those behaviors back to the stages within your sales process. And so the way I've always done it with our teams is, and there is like a series and I kind of break this down in the book as well, is we just kind of go through, okay, first, is there an internal project or initiative that has an executive saying, I care about this, this is important to me, mm -hmm. right? And then what is the evidence of? Are they communicating with language around that project to their team? Okay, is there a time-bound date for that initiative? And so you can go through a series of things that 
different from how a lot of sales stages are set up. It's all based on the seller's activity. Did you have a discovery meeting? Did you run the demo? Did you send a proposal? Right? Did you get on a call to review the proposal? It's like, you may have sent a proposal, but does the executive care? Will they read it? And does it align with what they are already saying? I have, you know, I'm putting yeah. this as top priority. I would hazard a wild guess here. And this is the biggest made up stat I've ever produced on the show. 60% of deals worldwide are currently sitting in that post demo stage in their CRM. Done the demo, waiting for them to get back to me on the decision. Like sent the proposal maybe like, and now we're waiting. Like if there was a category called waiting, that's where 90% of deals are sitting. And it's because they haven't understood the buyer's process and where they're in in that process. I agree. The, one of the things, and tell me how off base I am here, one of the things I've always encouraged for my clients to do when it comes to building a business case, before they produce a demo or a proposal, I said, could you please put on the hat of your buyer, your champion, and produce a business case that they would present to their executive as if it was them. So there's no selling material, bring in alternatives, show them why, show the metrics. Uh, like, look, I don't want your company on it. You're just one of the options in this business case that they're putting forward. Could you produce that perfect business case? And they're always like, yeah, they haven't framed, they haven't ever thought of it that way. When you're doing business cases, do you have some frameworks that you recommend for your clients? Is it always unique? So it goes back to this idea of compressing the message down into a series of small sound bites. And so the framework that we use is called the one page business case. And the goal is to compress everything that the executive needs into a single page that covers everything and I'll come break it down. First, a headline that uses internal language. Usually there's some type of like phrase or code name to refer to a project internally. So that comes first. If you don't have a sharp headline that immediately signals to the executive, like this is what you were just talking about on the all hands call to everybody, yeah. they're not going to keep reading. So once you get that um, sharp headline in place, by the way, I love this quote from David Ogilvy, like the legendary copywriter. He's yeah. like, you know, headlines are very important, but he would say my highest performing advertisements, I wrote and rewrote the headlines up to 140 times. So again, like one piece doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. One sentence in the framework can be the most challenging to write and write well. So that's the first piece. Then you go into outlining, framing, and layering the problem. So problem statement is next. Mm -hmm. What's going wrong blocking that priority? Why is it getting worse? Can you put some numbers into it and take it from just like a workflow functional level to more of a strategic company-wide issue? Once you've done that, then, and I appreciated your point around all of the alternatives. Before you go into product, you're outlining your recommended approach. So because this problem is blocking this priority, what do you do about it? There are a lot of different paths to solving that problem. So how are you framing and saying, this is the right path out of all of these alternatives that then leads to like, hey, we can do this in a very differentiated way. And when you do this, here is the third piece below the headline is the payoff. Like when you follow this approach, what are the good things that happen? And can you outline some scenarios for the impact against the target metrics that by the way, should mirror or relate back to how you're measuring the problem statement? So you see yeah. some you know, contrast between the two, very clear before, after. And then finally, last section is, okay, to unlock that payoff, what's the investment? Like, what's it going to take? And most people, they just talk about budget, like, hey, here's the price. And they forget about all of the time, people, resources, energy that's going to need to go into resourcing a successful project. That is where I think everyone falls down. Change management is a bigger blocker than budget more often than not. The efforts, companies have all of the same these projects on the go, they've got so much they're trying to do. I've got sellers that don't know yet my business process. There's a lot that goes into this. And now I need to add another thing that we're changing. Mm-hmm. I've just on board a new teams. I'm trying to coach them up on the basics. And now there's another thing that I'm changing. Change management, I think, is the biggest piece missing on most proposals that I've ever read. So I agree. And executives know this far better than anybody else. And I'll give you an example of a recent deal that I was working on where at first I was starting with a group of sales directors, kind of the contract value that we were working on. Their goal was to start building business cases. They do a lot of competitive deals for each of their deals. And it was was like going to be like a 15, 20 K, you know, contract couple teams within it, not a whole lot else. They're like, I think this will fit with 
the budget reality, right? So hmm. anyway, fast forward, we get up, CEO joins, we're chatting and he stops the meeting and he's like, this is going to be a serious initiative for the business. The biggest risk that I'm seeing right now is that we are planning to underinvest in this. So we are either going to spend six figures on this or we're not going to do it at all. Yeah. And we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, what would it look like to roll this out across existing business plus new business, every region with the like dedicated level of support from the internal leaders that it needs. And we stood up a whole project around it, got the six figure contract in place. But his point was like, you know, spending 20 K on this is going to be a total yeah. waste of time and energy. If this is important, we're going to overinvest and we're going to do it right. Or we're not going to do it at all. That's exactly it. I've got clients where end users land up being able to download an app for free. They're like, hey, we don't charge per user. We just charge you for the platform and they're selling this as a benefit. And I'm sitting there thinking, let me try to put myself, and this is where I think empathy, we talk about empathy as a seller. I think this is where that muscle is so important. I'm sitting there now in the project manager's mind thinking, oh, I've got to get 10,000 staff to download an app, create a username and password, register. This brilliant app that helps control the field now also tracks their location. So I'm going to have to answer about location tracking and I've got all of these half the team's libertarians and like they just thinking, oh my God, this is the biggest headache I've ever picked up. This is not free. This is going to cost me sleep for the next six months. Yeah, it is so true. And that's why like a executive looking at your business case is going to be thinking even before they get to budget and money, time and people resources, like people are the most expensive thing in the business and they can only focus on so many things at once. And so, you know, you tie it all the way back up into the headline is like, does this relate to a priority that they're already sold on and they care about? Yeah. Trying to get the team to move from Zoom to Google Meet. Something that two things do functionally exactly the same thing, like hard in my business to justify the difference. And even that was, it used mine as the founder, it used some of my social credit. I've, I had to force a change. I had to, they were like, oh, but we prefer Zoom. And I'm like, look, I appreciate we prefer Zoom. We're already paying for meets and I can't justify the expense. These are for internal meetings, like blah, blah, blah. And so I had to force it through, used up social credits, creating an irrelevant change that was pretty simple. Nobody had to download new things or create new usernames and still it cost the company because of a simple change. Yeah. Now, and here's the one other like interesting nuance in there is you were probably evaluating the other things that you may want them to start doing differently. And you were figuring out which of these asks am I going to cash in first right now? And so what can block and prevent a deal isn't necessarily like teams stealing the deal within the same competitive category. It could be something totally different where you're saying, you know, I really want the team focused on this. And so I'm going to ask them and I'm going to cash in some of my credit with them on this ask. Yeah. And like all of that comes down to really understanding what their problem is. And this is where we go all the way back up to discovery and in enterprise sales, discovery is a journey. Is what landed up closing this for my clients who had to bring on all of these end users onto this app. Instead of saying the end that the app is free, they said, we will include a customer support manager within this contract for $30,000 for the first year to call each person one-on-one -on -one and physically enable them to jump on board onto the platform and download the app. And they're like, ah, oh, you've taken this headache away from me. You've solved the actual problem. It's 30 grand. I don't, that wasn't the barrier. Yeah, so getting to this understanding of what the cost is, where the team is, what those bottlenecks are, and how they're going to use those credits is key. Now, your discoveries. Well, let's just go back to this book. Somebody reads the book. What's the main thing you think they're going to be left with? They're an enterprise seller. They read your book. What was their before state? What's their after state? I think after they are going to see that they have a brand new job description before they thought of themselves as I'm a conversationalist working in sales meetings in order to wow and get deals done. After they're like, holy cow, everything that I'm doing in a sales meeting is just tip of the iceberg or fraction, I now have to think about my job in a totally different way. It's almost like I just rewrote my job description by reading this book. I think that is going to be the major kind of guiding thought they, they leave with. What skill gap do you think they're going to find themselves having with this new job description compared to their old job description? The major skill, well, two, two of them. One, you just touched on it discovery and discovery in a way that is far deeper, far more strategic than they were ever thinking about previously. Most sellers will over index on demo and product discussion and they will under index on discovery. So that will be the first skill gap. Second skill gap is writing. And yeah. that is only increasing and widening, by the way, as people are relying more and like 
look, we also do writing for sellers in Fluent. It's the software platform. But if you think that you can outsource 100% of your writing to a machine and AI generated content, then that skill gap is only going to get wider. And so the sellers who come away, they have figured out just how important it is for them to be involved not necessarily in the drafting, getting blank page to 80% of the way, but that 80% to 100% of the way there to be very intentional about, go back to the idea of selling and sound bites that we were talking about earlier, of making sure that they, you know, they are able to script out some of the internal conversations that they're not part of with their content. Brilliant. Can they get some of these templates from you? Because, you know, you spoke about your one pager, uh, some of these templates to help people get out of the, the waiting stage, you know, things mm -hmm. to help move things along. You, you missed a point and you want to try to clarify something. Do you offer these? Like, is it just you sharing? I see them on LinkedIn all the time, but is there a formal way that a company could engage you to pad their templates and snippets with your wisdom? Yeah. If you want the DIY version, if you go to fluent.io backslash blog on there, just click the resource filter and there's like 30 different different templates resources that you can get. And there's one of them called the buyer enablement framework package that bundles a bunch of them up together. So I'd say check that one out first, influent.io backslash blog, and then just filter by resources. Yeah, this is a whole new world. And I'm so excited for people in my audience just to get a little bit of an exposure to this conversation.